Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Yeah, just, nah, just keep it. Morning, Morning, afternoon, noon, afternoon. It's 15. Yeah, happy afternoon. Good day to you. Oh, thank you all for coming on this Sunday. I'm sure you're all thoroughly exhausted, like me. Woo! That means you did it right. Yes. Oh, so everybody had a good time this weekend. Yeah. Did anybody? This was their first uh, anime next. Awesome, cool, cool. So we've got about, so I guess like half new people have returned. That's what it looks like. Awesome. Well, thank you all for coming. Anybody that was able to come to my other uh, panels over the weekend? Yay! Pretty much all of you. That's awesome. I hope you had fun, and I hope you learned some stuff. Like I just, before we get started, I just want to thank you all so much for the amazing support this weekend that you gave both me and my wife, and uh, just coming by and seeing us and coming to the panels and for your participation and all the questions. You've been absolutely incredible, and it's been. This has been one of the best convention experiences I've had in the last couple of years, so thank you so much. Love you guys. That's just, yeah, you, uh, this, we needed this weekend. <laughs> like, it was just so relaxing, just like, oh, this is what, this is what the good cons feel like. So yeah, so thank you very much. So today, so it's, since you all got to come to the other panels, uh, I will, initially, this was going to be a different panel, but I'm no because of contract stuff. I'm actually no longer allowed to do that panel, so we're doing the last Q and A. Uh, so, if there was any questions from the previous two panels over the weekend that you didn't get to ask, or anything that you, yeah, right out of the gate, man, let's do it. Well, I have two questions. Sweet. The first one is, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm great, man. Just a little tired. The second one is a bit more of a bold question, okay. and I think it will make everyone happy. Can we get a group selfie? At the end of this, hell yeah. Let's do a big old group selfie at the end. Don't let me forget. We've got one hour of fun time. Oh, and then we have to go to the airport. <laughs> in, in Philly. <laughs> so, so, hey, it's not that bad. Some of these guys some of these guys had to go to JFK. That's a place like a three hour drive for some of them. So like I know. We're just gonna we're going to Philly. So Yay! Yeah, but it's the only straight flight home, but then we get to go home and see our puppy. We have, I have, we have a year and a half old uh, sh uh, Shepherd Labrador mix. He is a, I wish I could show you all a giant picture of him right now. He is, he is my son. Uh, and I love him dearly. And he is just like, yeah, his name's Kanan. We named him after a Jedi. Uh, yeah, Kanan Jarrus. Uh, and uh, Bo, though, I, I, I really, really, really wanted him to be named Boba Fetch. <laughs> which was my wife's idea initially. And I was like, babe, I freaking love you. I want to marry you again for that name. And then she's like, actually, I wanted to be Kanan. And I'm just I want a divorce. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So, so, but the next one that we get, so since we've got the big boy, I want to get like a Corgi or a, or like a Shiba, like a Shiba Inu or something, and that will be Boba Fetch. And then they'll, we'll have our Star Wars dogs. And we've got two cats at home as well, so. You know, Gypsy and Yuri. And here's the deal, Yuri is not named after Yuri on Ice. I've had Yuri since 2005. I just adopted her. I named I named her Yuri after one of my favorite anime characters from uh, shows that I grew up watching. There was one called uh, The Dirty Pair, and like Yuri and Kay uh, were the main characters. And they're just there's these badass super spy babes basically, and they travel all throughout the universe righting wrongs, but the problem is they're really bad at their job uh, and, and they just end up destroying everything around them usually so like it's a, it's it's a super fun like 80s 80s style anime uh, and that had a spin-off series also called the Dirty Pair Flash and uh, they had a remake of it basically both of the series are fantastic but yeah Yuri uh, that Yuri is what I named my cat after, and she actually ended up kind of taking on, now that we've had Yuri on ice and everything, we've noticed that she actually has Yuri, Yuri's personality. <laughs> like, she's that very just kind of like, I don't want to do anything, no, just let me, let me I'm just like, oh no, and now I want you to love me. <laughs> it's just, that she's just, uh, she grew up on the street for a little bit, so I think she's more guarded. The other cat's just like, I'm a dog. 
Any other questions? Yes, right here in the front. Yeah, then we'll get to you. I went to Max's panel on Friday, and I asked these questions, but now I'm going to ask you. Okay. How did it feel like sitting next to Max scoring autographs? Oh, I mean, it's fine. I've, I've, yeah, it's just, uh, actually, like, we didn't really get to interact or talk all that much this weekend, and that's just kind of how it goes a lot of the times at the, at the cons and, you know, at the studio. We just kind of, hi, bye, with to each other. But no, Max is great. I like, I love sharing a room with him, sharing a space. He's a cool dude. Uh, you had a question, and then we'll get to you. I was at your voice acting panel yesterday, mm -hmm. and I asked you if you had anything else to say, anything more about the audition process. Mm. Yeah. All right. So, uh, and I have a follow up question after that. All right. Cool. So, I mean, for the audition process, like if, if an audition is being held, especially like for an anime or a video game or something like that, generally you'll walk in, try to get there at least half an hour early if you can. Uh, there will be sides on the table uh, or wherever you check in that will have images of the characters, a synopsis of the show, a synopsis of the character, usually one or two tips about the type of voice that they're looking for, and it'll have some sides. So just little, little, you won't, generally you won't ever see animation for the audition, like it'll just be, because they don't have time to queue up scenes and have you record scenes and, and, uh, and stuff like that. They have 15 minutes every person. So you don't have to match the flaps. So you don't have to match the flaps or anything on audition, they're just looking for voice and performance, Thank and you if you can take direction. Um, the flaps come later, <laughs> but uh, nowadays, uh, auditions are a little more few and far between, especially with how fast we are pumping stuff out. So it's a little harder for newer folks to, to get in, especially to stuff like Funimation or uh, uh, Sentai Filmworks and stuff. But they do still have their uh, open call audition list, which they do is just bit like like it sounds like it's an open call. So if you're on the list and you're interested in auditioning, you can call. It's a pretty long wait, I think, because they do the auditions every like three to six months and they'll call in over like two days or something, and so they'll call in like 100 people or something along those lines and do that. So, but it's, the list is much longer than 100 people, so you could be waiting as long as like two, three years for your chance. But in that time, you should be practicing and you know take that time to learn and do all that stuff while you're waiting for your chance so that when it comes, you're ready. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Is it. You go in, you do your best, you've usually done it about 15 minutes, and then you wait. Usually about a week to find out whether or not you got something, and if you hear nothing from them, you didn't get anything. It's the longest week ever. Pretty much, yeah. Oh, dude, when I was first starting out, just waiting just to find out if I could get a bit part or something, I, I, no joke, I sat next to the phone. Like, I unplugged the phone in the house and moved it to my room so that I could just answer it and be there and ready for it whenever I got a call, and I kept looking at the caller ID every time. The moment the phone ran off, it was just didn't matter what I was doing and like just waiting for it and you know you know when you do get that call it is one of the most amazing and victorious feelings ever but until you get to that point it's a lot of huh? <gasps> 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 and then did I get it <laughs> the, yeah it's you get told that's the other thing about this industry that I think a lot of people don't understand you will be told no about a hundred times before you're told yes and it happens all the time, forever. It never ends. Like, there, anytime I get a new part, there's always gonna be a little bit of a lull, probably, before I get the next one. So, like, you have backup plans, have other jobs, uh, don't do, like, some people. Like, there have been, I can, there are horror stories I could tell you about uh, people who just thought, got in their heads that voice acting was this very easy thing that they could do and that they were meant for it and that they were going to be the next big voice acting star of, you know, of anime or whatever. And they moved down to Houston or they moved to Dallas on a whim, left. There was one dude, I'll, I, I, I won't name names or anything, but like there was one dude was one year shy of getting his master's, a doctorate basically, like he was going to be a doctor. And all of a sudden he just got it in his head that no, acting was his true calling and he was going to go pursue and try to be a voice actor. So he moved to Texas, left his university, left the program, did not graduate, did not get his doctorate, did not get anything, left his fiance, left his family there because they all were just telling him, no, this is a stupid idea, you shouldn't be doing this. And he moved out. And apparently no one in his family had the heart to tell him the reason why he shouldn't be moving and trying to do this stuff is because he had a horrendous lisp a lateral lisp that 
without major training and therapy stuff, he would not be able to get rid of. And that pretty much just like, unless we have a character that has a lisp, you're, he's not gonna be useful for anything. So he's still living in Texas with, uh, and I believe the last, like this was years ago, but the last that I heard he had, we was working in a gas station. And like that was, that was it. Like it just kind of ended for him, lost his fiance, lost the future as, as a doctor and everything and gave it all up. Just, he just, he didn't think. So have, have a backup, be prepared. And if you already have something better in line for you right now, do that thing first. <laughs> and then start looking into voice work. If there's anything in the like, uh, if, there is ever, if there's ever a time where you're sitting around and you think, I wanna be a voice actor or I wanna try to be an actor or make it as an artist or something like that, think to yourself very honestly and deeply if, you, if, if there is anything else you can think of that you would be equally happy doing instead of voice work, do that other thing. I don't mean to like bring people's, people down or anything, <laughs> but like, it's, it, is, it is a rough industry, it is a very competitive, high turnover industry that, that has to, like, you will work very, very, very hard for overall very little pay. Uh, so it's, it's, especially if you're just wanting to work in animation. And that's another thing too, if you do want to get into voice work, do not ever make the mistake of thinking, I will just do anime. Do everything, play in every single field that is available to you in the world of voice work, industrials, commercial, narration, uh, uh, political ads. Uh, you can do like, there's, there's a market for that stuff everywhere. Every major city has that. So that's a market that even if you don't live in one of the major cities where anime or video games are made, that is a voice market that you can tap into and get your career and start your career that way, start building a resume. Uh, and then, you know, as that builds, you can then move on to, like, say, L.A. or a bigger market like that, and then you'll already have that resume, uh, and hopefully by that point you'll also have a demo made. Please, for the love of God, make sure your demo is professionally made. I know they're expensive. Sometimes you can drop upwards of $1,000 on a one-minute-long demo to get it professionally made. It is worth every penny. A well-made professional demo will last you years. Would you like to hear my voice demo? Yes. yes. Yeah. I'll give you a, this one I made very recently actually, about less than a year ago. Uh, this is my commercial demo currently. And this cost me roughly around $600 to make. Josh Greeley. At Boyle Tropical, we've been making the food you crave since 1988. Like our chicken, citrus marinated for 24 hours, then fire grilled to lock in the flavors. Ponder this. How does time fly on a plane? Sounds like a joke, doesn't it? The punchline. With free in-flight entertainment on every American Airlines flight. Buy a set of our top-rated select Nokia tires and get $50 in instant savings and an official New Era NFL hat. And you'll be entered to win a trip for two to the Super Bowl. Meet the Chase Pay app. It's designed to save you time and money. And now you can use the Chase Pay app at Shell. Download and try the Chase Pay app today. Jack Wings Jerky presents Running with Sasquatch. Mankind is not one thing, but two, those that have a wild side, and those that have a side that says, let's go camping, but indoors. The adventures have changed, but the spirit is the same. That burning, greedy hunger, that push to sharpen your skills and pick up some scars. And we're still tailored for those same few. This is the time. And that's it. It goes around one minute, four seconds tops. And that's generally around the time that you want your demo to end. That same goes for a character or voice demo. The only thing that should ever be longer than 60 seconds is, an, uh, is a narration demo, because obviously you're gonna be speaking a lot more with narration, so generally those run about four minutes for a, for a, narr for a narration demo. You, and you, you heard, like uh, I had a sound engineer that was there with me at a studio recording me in a professional, in, like in their studio setup. This is a place where they uh, help mix movies for, to, like to go to, to go to American theaters. Uh, and he sat there with me for uh, pretty much half of a day uh, 
helping me pick out the right music, trying to figure out which, which was the best way to, to, to uh, which spot should be in what position in the demo, like what should be at the beginning, the middle, the end, and just like overall helping me craft something that sounded good and uh, was fairly consistent, but still showed off my range uh, with, and you know, you don't have to worry about going like super wide with your range when it comes to commercial stuff. You like save the really intense vocal uh, demo for like your character demo. That's where you really get to show off. Uh, but yeah, I mean, one minute long, buy five, six hundred dollars. I will probably not have to replace that for another ten years, uh, unless I start to realize that oh no, I, I I can do even better with some of my commercial reads and stuff like that. Then I might make a new one within. You know, probably half that time, if not sooner. But a well-made one will last you for a very, very long time. And as long as you have that file, I mean, really these days, all you got to do when you're sending out resumes and stuff is to have a professional, again, professionally made headshot. Again, one you probably five to a thousand dollars, five hundred to a thousand. Um, and uh, your resume, and just put your demos on a flash drive, and then put that into a yellow envelope, and you send those off. To, uh, to your agents, and then usually uh, any agents that, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Any agents that are worth their salt, uh, if they get your demo and you call them, you know, you, they bring you in for an interview or they just want to like tell you, hey, we're sorry, you didn't really, you're not really what we're looking for, or we don't feel like you're up to our standards, any agent worth their salt will be willing to answer, okay, where should I go to? become worth it in your eyes and they will tell you this is the people that we recommend and trust for taking like acting courses or for improving your game like improving your uh, auditioning for commercials or your helping you with your commercial reads or helping you with uh, getting better headshots done or getting a better demo done they will help you because they want to have good assets that they can get work for so like yeah just it's a lot of trial and error. It's a lot of just kind of figuring out how to get in. All the tips that I gave you both at uh, the panel yesterday and what I've been talking about for the last 10, 15 minutes is kind of the what I would consider to be the basic bare bones package of what you need to know to really start yourself on your journey. Uh, just don't make the mistake of thinking that this is like the end all be all of how to get into the industry. The truth is every single voice actor that you've heard of, you know, that works in anime and video games and cartoons and stuff uh, continuously, we all fell into this bass backwards. Like we, like some of us sought it out intentionally, uh, but a lot of us started as actors in other fields and just found our way here. Uh, and so, as long as you keep in mind that there is no one way Use that to your advantage, because if there's no one way to get in, that means you can make your own. So, yeah, figure out what works for you, and then and go from there. Does that answer you? I know I answered your question about ten times over at this point, but like, anything else? Um, and I'll get to you in just a second. I mean, I want to take the opportunity away from anyone, everyone else, but okay. what you just said is a good segue to my other question. Okay. And maybe you already answered it, but I'll ask it anyway. What's the best kind of experience to have before you start auditioning for Funimation, Sentai? Uh, any acting experience, first and foremost. Like, that's why we say uh, over and over and over again, become an actor first. But like, uh, like if I do any, like, fan-made stuff, any fan-dubs, or uh -huh. a bridge series? Would that be I, I would be careful with that, because generally uh, companies uh, frown on actors that were originally involved with like a bridge series and fan made series and stuff like that especially do not ever put anything like that on a resume do not ever put fan made projects or fan dubs or anything like that on any sort of professional resume because a anybody that's outside of anime is not going to know what those things are or care and second people who are in anime like Funimation are going to know that you were working on projects that were illegal so uh, yeah it's just just I would avoid it if possible. Uh, or if you do, use a pseudonym and never tell them <laughs> that you did it. Uh, but other than that, uh, other things that I, I think really help people uh, for auditioning for Funimation or just working in anime in general, uh, get have a sense of musical timing. If you've ever had any sort of choir experience or band experience, it's really gonna help you with dubs because a lot of it is finding the cadence with the lines uh, and figuring out, uh, you have to be able to memorize a, a full paragraph of dialogue and remember 
where you're supposed to pause, where you're supposed to uh, speed up or slow down the read, and where you're supposed to, like any, everything that you have to do in order to make sure that that line fits into those flaps, and you have to do it the first time that you see it. Uh, so you, you really kind of have to, having a sense of musical timing and cadence and stuff like that will help you to guide yourself along uh, uh, in dubbing those lines, if that makes sense. Uh, so any sort of choir training or musical training or just anything along those lines will help you. Learn to cold read, just picking up something random like a newspaper or magazine or opening a random Google search or something and pull that up. Get used to pulling it up, reading it, and performing it out loud as if you've rehearsed it. Because again, you, when you're recording anime and video games, there is zero auditioning. I mean, there is zero uh, rehearsal. There's zero practice beforehand. You do not get to see the script as an actor before you go in and record. It is, you go in the box and you perform it. So, uh, yeah, just get used to cold reading and sight reading and, and getting comfortable with performing something that you've never seen. And, uh, yeah, that's, those two things are, I think, the biggest. You bet. Thank you. Right. Just like when you mentioned about your dog, um, on you mentioned Yuri. How is it doing the actual character Yuri from Yuri on Ice? Yuri was one of the most challenging characters that I've done in my career in the 15 years that I've been doing this. It was awesome because at first, like I mean, we mentioned this kind of a little bit in passing last night, but uh, Yuri was one of those roles that I mean, when it was first coming out, we knew nothing about it. Uh, we just had that little two-minute little. Uh, video clip and thought, oh, it's free. They just froze the water. And, and so it just kind of thought, okay, well, this is, this is what, what we we're expecting. Obviously, it was not that. Uh, and, you know, and since there was no original manga or a, uh, uh, a novella or anything that we, or a short story that we could, you know, that it's based off of, nothing that we could pull information from, we went into it completely blind. We didn't we, every week, as you were finding, figuring out the story, we were finding out the story. So, uh, we, yeah, so, like, every, whenever I would be dubbing, let's say, episode four, episode five would have just aired in Japanese the night before, so me and Sonny, the director, would already be talking about, like, did you see last night? What'd you think of this? I can't believe he made that triple sound count! Yeah! And just, like, and... Uh, or, or just like, and we would start hearing rumors and stuff. Like the fan base was, you know, starting to have those major theory crafts. And there was one we saw where, like, after the episode where Yuri pokes Victor's head, and he's like, "Is it getting that thin?" I mean, he's just like, "No, no, no, no." Um, we had people started thinking, "Victor's hair is getting thin. He has cancer. He's gonna die." <laughs> and then we were just like, "They wouldn't do that." <laughs> what? <the hell? laughs> Oh, he's gonna die! And then it's just like, oh, we started freaking out too, and like, but we got pulled into it, man. So yeah, like, and it, it was really awesome because, like, at the beginning, at the beginning of every major season, every four month period, uh, every property that Funimation gets, uh, they they try to do like a, a projected. Um, uh, kind of a guess of like what they think uh, is going to be the end of the series rankings. So like what shows of that season were ranked the highest. Uh, Yuri on Ice out of the shows that we had, which was that season was like 22 or something. Yuri on Ice at the beginning of that season was rated at uh, rank 14. They, they thought this would be the like potentially the 14th most popular show that they had of that season. After three weeks, by the third episode, it jumped up to one and it never left like, it just it just exploded like just moved right up and it was like we we had a we had a surprise hit on our hands basically and so as this was going on and we're just seeing how this show is building up and what the story is turning into and meeting all these other characters and finding out about like like what what it's going to take for yuri to you know find his love again for his art and, and like just, the, just everything that was happening. We were like, we were following along and being just as excited as the rest of the fan base because it was dragging us along. Like it was just like, nope, you'll, you'll be a fan of this too. And we were like every week we had people in the, uh, um, we had people in uh, the marketing side of the building which were handling, you know, all the social media and everything else for it that were just, 
blown away by it, and they were becoming such hardcore fans that they were already buying up every bit of Yuri merchandise they could find in Japan, including Yuri makeup kits. And like, I mean, it was like there was bath there was bathroom stuff Yuri themed that was being made in Japan and selling. I like it's like it just exploded. Um, so yeah, as, as it went on, we just kind of we all just fell in love with the show and as I was recording Yuri myself I, I found a lot of uh, similarities between himself like his life at that point in the story with parts of my life you know, chasing my art because so much of Yuri like the, the, the real I, I think at least like the, one of the, the core parts of Yuri is the story wise at least is about the pursuit of perfection in art uh, like in the moment that we first meet Yuri he's failed at that art that's the first words out of his mouth is, hi, I'm Yuri Kotsky of the JSAF, and my life is a dumpster fire. And it's just, and it's just he, he failed at his art, and he felt horrible for it. He lost the, the confidence in himself. He lost the love for himself and for his art. And the story ends up being kind of this really beautiful talent story, this, uh, this beautiful story about how love helped him find love for himself again and love for his art and allowed him to overcome his worst enemy, who was himself. And where does he fight himself? On the ice. That's why it's called Yuri on Ice. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and the hardest moment of the whole series at that point was uh, the garage scene. Uh, when they're in the parking garage, the Grand Prix final, and he finally lets out all of that tension and all of that self-doubt and all of those horrible things he'd been thinking since episode one and this big moment of just, I need you to believe in me because I don't. And how many times have you felt that in your life? Anybody here felt that at some point? Just like, please, I just need someone else to be here for me. It looks like it's, it was so real. It was such a human moment. And, and, and just, and also just, I, I think we can all relate to Yuri on some fashion, whether like whatever your art is, skating is his art, but if you draw, write, uh, paint, if you're an actor, if, you ha if you're an athlete of some kind, and you dedicate yourself to a craft, you are, you know how Yuri feels. If you've ever been, have ever felt, why am I trying? Why did I think I could do this thing? Why did I think I would be any good when there's so many people that are already so great out there? Why should I try? Uh, it's like, that's Yuri when we first meet him. And, and, and to, so getting to go on this journey with him throughout the show helped me overcome stuff that I had been fighting personally for years. Like it was therapy getting to play Yuri and, and to go on that journey of self-healing and finding love for your art again uh, really kind of helped me out too. So like it's, it's and that scene especially, like after, after he uh, has that big cry and he lets it all out and, and he just he finally confronts those feelings, he goes out and he skates his best skate of the whole series, like right then and there. It's like he's no longer in his head. He's no longer fighting himself. He is at one with himself and at peace with himself. And he just is. And when he goes out on the ice, there's no battle anymore. It's just him. And, and like, yeah, it's... Uh, the show is amazing. That's the answer. It was, just, it was a fantastic experience. Win. And then Spider-Man. Are there any other characters that you see, like, you see yourself? If, there, she, if you couldn't hear, she asked if there's any other characters I see myself in. Uh, did anybody last year uh, see a show called Recovery of an MMO Junkie? Yes. I played Sakurai for the dub in that, and that's me. <laughs> if you want to know who I am outside of this, go watch MMO Junkie and pay attention to Sakurai. That is me 100%. Yes. <laughs> Building computers, playing online games, like, yeah, that's... The, everything, everything about Sakurai and that. And there's, this is a very deep answer I'm actually giving you. So like, you go and watch it. Like, I, when I say everything about that character, I mean everything about that character is me. So like, yeah, Spidey. So uh, you, you kind of just touched on it, but do you find any of your uh, roles having an impact on your personal life? Like, do you learn lessons from it and become a better person? Yeah, totally. 100%. Uh, Kurinosuke from Mrs. Jellyfish uh, helped me through a really rough time. Uh, 
still kind of, you know, occasionally deal with it, but uh, uh, it, I was going through a very rough patch of dealing with uh, a sort of lifelong gender dysphoria. And Kurinosuke gave me the opportunity to comfortably and safely kind of explore that femininity and that ability to, uh, because like he just loves fashion and he loves the fact, like he doesn't see himself as anything that like not normal or anything, he's not a freak or anything like that, even though some people might call him that, he doesn't see that and that's so empowering. And he, uh, the entire time, he's just like, no, I'm about fashion, I know what I love, I know who I am and this is it. And he makes no apologies for it. And so being able to get to experience that through him really kind of helped me figure out who I was and came to grips and was more comfortable with that dysphoria and it kind of helped me figure out a way to deal with it, which ended up being uh, kind of the same thing that Sakurai does in MMO, in, in MMO Jungle. So like, again. From, from one uh, to another that's they, experienced that, you are valid. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and Kenichi from Kenichi My Disciple helped me with uh, kind of figuring out, like, because I also kind of saw myself, like, Kenichi was this role that I did almost fresh out of high school. I'd, I'd only been doing this for about three years at that point, so I was still in my early 20s. And then Kenichi hit, and uh, it helped me kind of get over that uh, being ashamed of the me that was in high school that felt like uh, an outcast and a weakling and stuff like that. And just be like, no, I can... I can overcome myself and I can overcome the people that, you know, try to bring me down or get in my way. And yeah, it's like there's, I, I try to learn a little something from every character that I play, if I can. Can you change? Yeah, can you change? Right. I love your Zen. Oh, wait, wait, you're not Zen, you're Todoroki. Yes, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I love it, Yellow Tree. Thank you very much. Yeah, another question. Let's get somebody over here first. Yeah, Yuri, and then Victor. It's, oh, no, no, no. Crystal, sorry. Oh, yes, hi. It's my thing. Yes, what was your question? So, like, I was talking to you a little while ago with yeah. the autograph room. Like, Yuri himself, like, means a lot to me as a character because he's, like, so real and, like, he's, like, one of the only characters that, like, really shows, like, anxiety and, like, panic attacks. Yeah. And it's also, like, really nice because. <laughs> Somebody had the pate. <laughs> it was bad. And like the way that like he feels about Victor and like that they're kind of together. Uh -huh. Well, you we know while they're together, but it's not like official order. Right, but right. It's like so nonchalant and like nobody like says anything about it. Like uh -huh. that's not like the focus of the show. Uh -huh. But but like so what is Yuri, like, means to you, like, being able to say that, like, Yuri, Yuri, what does that mean to you? That is a deep question. <laughs> like, uh, I kind of don't understand the question, to be honest. Just, just, just one part, though. Uh, when you're saying, like, are you asking me, uh, like, what does being Yuri mean to me in terms of his relationship with Victor or just like Yuri in general? Just Yuri in general. Just Yuri in general. Okay, so like what does he mean to me? Uh, he means he means that as long as you surround yourself with people who are there for you as much as you are there for them uh, and are willing to trust in those people and in yourself that you never need be afraid of being who you are. And you never need be afraid of failing because failing is also a teacher. And it's, it's not a mark of shame and it's not a mark of, of being less capable at something. It just means that you're trying and that you're working at something and that it's okay to Remember, and it's it's also okay to not be the best, because there's always going to be someone better, and there's always going to be someone that, and those people should be the things that inspire you to continue being better. So that's what Yuri means to me. Okay. Um, so 
I, I understand if you are not able to say anything with NDAs and stuff, um, okay. working in publishing, but um, is there yeah. any time frame or something that we should be looking for? Because we've heard a lot about Yuri on Ice Adolescence with yeah. the yeah. season two. Is there anything that you are allowed to share about that, such as maybe when we should be looking mm -hmm. forward or getting excited or anything we should know? You know as much as I do at this okay. point. <laughs> and I mean that, I'm being 100% honest. Yeah, no, no, no. no, no, no. It's like, it's, it's so often, more often than not because of, I mean, and I'm sure the past couple of years you've, you've all heard about the uh, Spider-Man actor and how <laughs> angry Disney is about how he just randomly <laughs> puts out spoilers and stuff like that. The, like, the Japanese are so, uh, are, are so worried about spoilers and stuff like that coming out that they just don't tell us anything. <laughs> so like they, like, they don't even tell Funimation until they're ready to tell them. So like generally, we find out at the same time that you guys find out. So all I know is that Adolescence was supposed to come out this year. There has not been any sort of talk, at least said to me, about a season two yet. So what I'm hoping is that Adolescent, Ice Adolescence is what we're gonna do is the same thing that we've done with the last major anime movies that we've had, like the My Hero movie and you know the recent Dragon Ball movies and stuff, which is to have a theatrical release. And if we have the theatrical release in the States of the Yuri on Ice movie and a lot of people go to see it, hopefully that proceed will be what they use to create season two. That's what I'm hoping. So once we do find out for sure when the date is, I'm guessing at this point winter because I said a lesson. Um, um, so probably around winter this year is what I'm hoping. The Olympics. Pro oh my God, of course, because the, it's the Olympics. Oh. Maybe. That's true. So probably around that time is what I'm hoping. And if that happens, then of course, you know, as soon as it's ready, we'll probably, Funimation, as long as they have the rights to it still, we'll be the ones to go into production on it. And we'll see what happens. Yes, Kiko, and then we'll get over here. Um, so related to that, um, I heard your talk on the how um, simul dub and the, the process of localization are done for the television animation. Mm -hmm. um, so how would that be done for films? Is it similar or different? And how do you how late do you know in terms of the, when the Japanese analysis is released in Japan mm -hmm. and when that comes to? Elsewhere. So, like, if generally, from what at least from what I understood, is that uh, whenever Funimation finds out from the Japanese about any sort of project that they're already currently involved in, it seems like I generally find out about it within, if I'm involved in it at least, I, I generally find out about it maybe as soon as two weeks out or as far out as a month. Um, so, not a whole lot of time actually, uh, but. I would imagine that, uh, and, you know, and generally a lot of that is because like they, they like to keep stuff very close to the chest until they're ready to talk about it, uh, just to avoid leaks or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I think probably like two weeks to a month is generally when they start to reach out, or at least that's when I find out from the director of the show, so who knows, they could have known probably for about a month. I just, stop talking to me. Um, <laughs> They, uh, like for Attack on Titan, like we knew that they were gonna be starting up uh, again roughly around, uh, about a month out. So yeah, I, that's probably the, that's probably the timetable. In terms of like actually translating and getting everything ready for dubbing and everything, I would assume that the moment that we have the movie materials, they'll start translating it and that, that will probably, they'll probably put a team of translators on that instead of just one person. Uh, to, to make sure that it gets done not only with multiple eyes on it but as fast as possible so that we can get our release done because generally like with the last couple of movies they've tried to release the dub at least at this of like roughly the same time as the Japanese version comes out in Japanese theaters uh, to kind of keep with our whole simul dub model so like I would imagine that if whenever Yuri on Ice does come out in Japan we'll probably have the dub ready relatively around the same time uh, yeah, as long as the simul dub relationship stays the same, but yeah, that that should does that answer? Your, was that both of your questions? Sure. Uh, I just just briefly, um, how so? How much time are given for the translators, and how much time are given for the writers? Or, you know, for a movie, I have no idea. I actually never got to. I never. I was lucky enough to never have to write a feature film. 
I just got episodes, because I like I liked dealing with bite-sized things, because uh, that gave me just a very clear uh, deadline every week, where it, with a movie, it's like, that's roughly three episodes length, so you'll have like three weeks to do it, and I'm just really bad at managing time like that, especially when I have recording and conventions and everything else, I'm just like, just give me a little episode, please. Something with a lot of fighting so they don't talk. <laughs> so like, <laughs> that's easy. Uh, but yeah. And someone was not asked a question yet. So look at you, man. And then um, Bobby. Yes. Tom, I was just, I just want to know, like, what's your schedule like when you're not recording? You said you have like a lot of downtime. I do have a lot of downtime lately. Um, when I was when I was also a writer, generally I had no downtime at all. Uh, it would be Monday through Thursday most weeks. I would be I would be writing scripts at home, and then whenever and going in to record during the day for whatever time they had me coming in. And that, that could be two hours one day, four hours the next day, half an hour one day. So like you, you never really know. It's just however they can jigsaw in, in the schedule because uh, they're dealing with 20 shows a season. <laughs> so it's just kind of like you, there's a, that's a lot of scheduling happening. Um, but now that I, I, don't, I don't write anymore, I have a lot more downtime. <laughs> so uh, most weeks now, Monday through Thursday, I just, uh, for right now, this season, Attack on Titan and Kono Oto are the only two shows that I, and uh, whatever's going on with Black Clover are the only shows that I'm involved in right now, and those all have fairly decently sized casts, except for Kono Oto. Um, so I'm recording roughly about two hours a week, average. Uh, and then conventions are the rest of my gig. Like I leave on a Thursday, usually in the morning or early afternoon, come go to wherever the convention's gonna be. I'm there till Sunday evening or Monday morning, then I fly home and I do it again. Uh, but in the interim, those like two or three days, if I don't have recording, I am at home in my pajamas. <laughs> and I'm playing video games all day long. Or, or I'm drawing, or I'm doing like I'm doing some other artistic stuff, and, and planning planning other things. So you know the, the job never really ends. Like I, I really should be using a lot some of that free time to be getting my resume out to some other places again, and, and starting to, to get a new presence in some other markets and stuff like that. But like I'm I'm still kind of on a in my mind at least I'm on a, like a mini vacation after spending ten years as a writer. Uh, so I'm just enjoying the free time right now. Yeah. Oh, what did I write? Yes. My absolute favorite show that I that I that I got to write for, and it was the last show that I did, and I was the lead writer for it, which was huge. Like, that was something I had worked really hard to, to try and be. Uh, was Overlord? Wow. The first two seasons of Overlord, I was the lead writer on, and the second season I wrote entirely myself. And now, uh, since, uh, since I no longer work for the writing team, uh, Aaron Dismuke, uh, is, who is also the writer for Attack on Titan this season, is is writing Overlord season three, and then the, and the rest of it and stuff. And he's doing a freaking amazing job with it as well. So. Uh, I also wrote uh, a lot of fairy tale. Uh, in fact, my first episode, my first episode that I wrote was when Wendy and Carla are introduced, and I wrote up to the Tartarus arc of that. So, like a couple hundred episodes, and uh, I've helped write JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Stardust Crusaders, uh, Gundam Wing, Iron Blooded Orphans. Uh, Shakugan no Shana, Seraph of the Ends, uh, uh, Castletown Dandelion, um, what was, uh, oh god, what was the one that I just did? Uh, what was the one that I did uh, about, um, I can't even remember it now, like, oh, oh, the, uh, uh, the, the little blonde girl that was a detective. Uh, uh, Gosik, yes, I wrote Gosik. I was the I was the lead writer for Gosik, for the dub of Gosik and stuff. Yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I, I did that for about ten years. Uh, I wrote a whole lot of stuff and some stuff for Sentai Filmworks as well. I wrote the AKB 0048 dub scripts, which yeah, a lot of people didn't see that. Uh, all sorts of stuff over the years. Let's see, yes, Oh, I said I said I was gonna get Bobby's question first. Yes. Personally, hope Friday ends up being quintessential quintuplets. Anybody else watching quintessential quintuplets as of this current season? Yeah, there's gonna be a new season later this year. Uh, I hope he ends up with Ichika, the the actress. Not that I'm biased. 
<laughs> or anything, but like, uh, yeah, the blue shirt here, you had a question as well. Yeah, it's probably the movie. Um, about how long would you say like, it takes you guys to like, voice an episode or a movie? Like, how long are you in the studio? One episode of like a one 22 to 25 minute episode of anime takes us one week from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. recording. Uh, so Monday, actually, so five days really, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, they're just sh shoving actors in as fast as they can. Like, 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 yeah, you just look at the script and go for it. I mean, that's that's the way it's been for forever. It's like you you go in, you know, you see just your character's lines. You have a script on one screen and a, the anime uh, with a time code on the other screen, and you just they'll scroll the script and the episode to your line. The director will tell me what the scene, what what's going on in the scene, what's happened recently, what I'm responding to, and I read, you know, the uh, the other characters that are speaking around me, so I get an idea of what's happening, and then they well, watch it in Japanese, and then get the timing down. They're like, oh, okay, go, and then you do it. So like you have in the, and then okay, that's done. Next line, you got about. We'll preview the line, so I have about 10 seconds to figure out the timing, figure like memorize the line, and then look back and just do it on screen. Or I can constantly do this, <laughs> and it's just yeah, that's pretty much what you do. So it takes about yeah, and that's uh, it's always one person at a time, unless we're doing big background character things. So like if there's like an arena, like we're at a football game or something, and there's an arena full of people, they'll bring in two groups of four people, four actresses, four actors. Uh, and they'll all get in the booth at the same time and they'll do two passes of each of those things and just hooping and hollering and improv and just saying ridiculous stuff because you'll never actually hear what it is because uh, it's buried in the mix. Like sometimes we had, we had entire background uh, stuff. Uh, ADB Films used to have entire background uh, scenes where people were just saying watermelon, 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 and and, and, so, and just like, and then just layering it with. So it sounds like a whole bunch of people, but really it's just eight people doing like four separate passes of a scene. So then it sounds like a thousand people. Uh, that probably happened a lot with like the scenes, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Anytime there was you know Yuri and then we're skating, they had. They had the wall in there, they had the crowd, so there was always people coming in just to hoop and holler for the skaters and everything. So yeah, it was it, it's it's fun sessions, but like Walla Walla breaks your like that that that's the training ground right there for a lot of actors as Walla. Because if you can go in and show a director that you're willing to scream your throat raw for one of those things, then they'll know that you're someone who's willing to go the distance for any part. And they'll they're more willing to give you some of those, especially if the character like Armin is a screamer, like it's, it's, it just has a lot of energy to it and everything. Um, there's so many questions, and I want to make sure everybody gets, who has not asked a question yet that has their hand up. All right, uh, let's get you and then you. So Yuri, and then back to Todor and then you, and then Todoroki, and then we'll get you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You. Um, so do you have any theories for the Yuri and Ice? I'm I'm really hoping that the movie, because as far as I understood it, at least from rumor or whatever has been posted online, is that it's supposed to be about Victor's origins. So I'm wondering if there's going to be a lot of flashback and stuff. So I'm hoping that if it is a flashback-based thing, that we get to see young Victor skating with young Kristoff and like figuring out and then, like getting to see like their relationship early on when they were. Excuse me. When Victor when uh, Victor was still focusing on skating and everything like that, and hopefully we get a little bit more of like him and Yuri and whatever, like what their relationship is becoming and maybe some, like see what Yuri is doing. My big thing is I really want to see two things. I want to see where JJ ends up. <laughs> because if you think about it, JJ is now Yuri. When, when the show starts, Yuri, Yuri is the exact opposite of JJ. JJ has all the confidence, he has the fans, he is, he is at the top of his game, everybody thinks he's going to be the next champion. He is not that. Then at the end, they've completely switched positions. Now JJ is the one who feels like he doesn't know, he doesn't believe in himself anymore. He doesn't know if he is a champion material or if he can do anything. He's like, he's like they completely switch. I want to see where JJ's going to go now. Like, is he going to eat some humble pie and actually like, or, or whatever. Um, I also want to see where Yurio is going to end up. Because with Yurio, Yurio achieved what he wanted to on a technical scale in terms of like just being technically good at skating, but he never found his agape. He never felt it at any point. Like he, like he, he 
pushed himself to the limit physically. And you hear, even, even Yuri says it was like, that was a skate that broke him. Like, that, like that's a skate that just took everything he had. And it was amazing. But he didn't feel it. You could tell. So what I'm hoping is that he finds a friend. <laughs> Yuri -O needs a friend. Oda back! Oda back! Preferably a friend with a motorcycle. So, like, so like uh, yeah, and that's the thing. Whether or not it means whether or not it's gonna be like a, a just a really awesome friendship or a loving relationship, I don't know. I would uh, like I feel like with him, it's more like he just needs a friend because he doesn't open himself up to anybody but his grandfather. And grandpa's not gonna be around forever. <laughs> so like, get a friend, here you go. Yeah. Okay. Who next? Yes. Okay. So what was your favorite scene? Favorite scene in Yuri on Ice, uh, the garage scene, because that it was very challenging and just like that. That's the, that's such a that's the climax of Yuri's uh, of Yuri's character arc. I think uh, that's the big moment for him. Um, favorite line: Poor cutlet balls. Did I really say that? I'm gonna crawl under a rock and die. So, or second favorite, runner up. Hey, Victor, I got an idea. <laughs> if I win the dance-off, come to Hosetsu and be my coach! You'll do it, won't you, Victor? Be my coach! <laughs> Fun thing was, I had no idea that the Drunk Yuri scene was even in there because I always watched the episodes when I was previewing them up to the credits, and that happened after the credits. So like, when we recorded that episode, I had no idea. I was just like, we saw the credits roll. Thanks, Sonny. He's like, get back in that box. <laughs> so I get in and like, yeah, and then we did this like first time seeing it. I'm so glad that's the way it happened because if I had seen it beforehand, I would have like over prepared. Like, how would I sound drunk? Instead, it was just like, uh, uh we we'll drunk. And, and, and it, just, it just happened. And so like, I feel like it, it's far funnier that it happened that way. And yes, Stan, okay, you had a question. I do have a, I have a question, a small request. Okay. Um, first, you, you talked a lot about um, like how to get into voice acting, mm -hmm. but you did do writing. How did you, can you touch on how you got into writing? I had established myself at that point uh, with ADV Films as, uh, this was like 2006, 2008, like 2007, 2008. And uh, I just, uh, Monica Rial had already, who was you know big actress already at that time, had started working with some of the writing team as well because she wanted to break into the writing thing. And she had kind of helped me get into the Houston, uh, she helped me get into Funimation eventually, but like she also, uh, was the person who uh, first, when I, I asked about writing, she said, well, I've already done it. I can give you, I can give you the content information for the guy at ADV wow. that did it. And so I contacted him, did the whole, like, here's my resume, here's what I'm interested in, like, here's, and like, had no professional writing experience at that point other than just what I learned in school. And so like, I, I gave him a creative writing example. He thought it was good enough that they were like, okay, we can work with this. And he just let me go and, and gave me my first show pretty much right out of the gate as something to, to, to test me on to write. And it was this little show called Magic Kano uh, back in like 2007. It was just about a bunch of sister witches that have a, a brother who has no magic. So they have to constantly, anytime he discovers that they are actually witches or that magic is real, they have to make him forget by hitting him with a hammer. Uh, and like, with just a big old magic hammer. And, and uh, it's it, the show itself is hilarious and it's one of the funniest scripts, that, even today, it's one of the funniest scripts I wrote because I just went ham with it. I essentially wrote two scripts for the show. One that was just straight translation as a, well, straight translation plus, you know, just the usual thing that we do in terms of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, localization, thank you. Uh, but then the other script was just, this is it, this is like if uh, South Park got a hold of it. <laughs> and, and just like, it was just a comedy thing and I had a whole bunch of modern references in it because it took place in modern Japan and everything. So like, it, it just, it, it, it had kind of a small cult following for a while. You could see the whole thing on, like, I don't know if you can even get it anymore. Uh, but uh, yeah, Magicano was, was a lot of fun. But that, that's pretty much how I got in was just like, 
they already knew me for being an actor, so we already had an, a pretty good working relationship, and they decided to give me a try on another aspect of the of the industry, and then eventually I ended up doing it for Funimation as well. Uh, also, I just wanted to know if you could do your favorite line for Sakurai. For Sakurai? Oh God! Actually, I'll see if I can pull this up real quick. Uh, I have a an outtake I did as Sakurai. Um, you won't be able to see it, sadly. But so basically, there's a scene where Sakurai and the female character, the lead female character of the of the show, uh, are in his house, and she's taking a shower because they just got out of uh, a rainstorm. And he's being, they're both super shy, very introverted, and they both like secretly like each other type of thing. So like, he's trying to very hard to be, you know, a gentleman and everything. He, he brings, he comes to the bathroom with some fresh towels and he's just like, like not looking or anything. She's like, um, I brought you some towels. Here you go, you can dry yourself off and stuff like that. And instead, um, instead this is what the actress heard when she, when she came in. If I can figure out where the heck I put it. I didn't leave it. I didn't delete it. Oh, it's in my videos. I might, I might not have saved it on this phone then. I'm so sorry, guys. Uh, so, like, favorite Sakurai line then, I suppose, would be uh, there's a episode at the uh, the very last episode of the series that we do where he's. Uh, they get transported inside the game. It's just a, it's a funny episode. So they get like, transported inside the game and Sakurai uh, is the princess in distress and the female and she's the, and the, the girl is all this, the warrior and everything has to come and save him. So there's a one point where Ian's carry, Ian Sinclair's character in the show um, is like being the evil demon king or whatever who's kidnapped Princess Sakurai and he's trying to be all lechy and stuff on him. And so like he he's just goes, he just goes, Fun, get to play him that way. Dang it, I'm so upset at myself now. I thought I had this. I bet I could find it. If I Take had. your time. I know. <laughs> Babe, could you like, could you see if you could find this for me? I thought it was in my videos. I would love to take the time. We only have four minutes. All right, cool. Uh, yes, all right. So I said that you would get a question. Um, yeah, the anim animation, yeah. For um, yesterday, with the uh, data life, out of all the um, spirit girls, uh -huh. Which one was like your personal like favorite out of them all? In Data Live, I tell she ended up being a lolly, uh, the witch in the most recent season. I dug her outfit. I loved the character design. I loved like the the purple and orange kind of Halloweeny witchy look, or whatever. I was just like that looks awesome. Uh, and then she just ended up being a little kid in disguise or whatever. I was just like, God dang it, Japan. <laughs> uh, but other than, than her, uh, I really like um, Miku. She's hilarious. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, of all the shows you worked on, all the voice actors you've worked with over the years, who would you say was your favorite to work with and from what show? Dude, I can't, there's no possible way I could pick that man. I'm sorry, that's just, that's way too much to sift through and think about. Um, though, uh, a, an honorable mention, if you will, would be I absolutely adored working on a show called Toriko with, also with my buddy Ian, he was Toriko the lead and I was his little buddy Komatsu, who was, uh, basically it was Dragon Ball Z, but food. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, it was freaking great. So like, I just like, uh, yeah, my character is just this world-class chef, but he's not a fighter. Toriko is this massive, all-powerful fighter, and so the whole thing is just you go and you kill food, and then you eat it. Yes. And, and, then, and, like, and it's just, it's amazing. If we, unfortunately, the anime never didn't go very far, and, and like it was animated by Toei, the same folks that did Dragon Ball and One Piece and stuff. If you want just a fun, like, every single episode, I we all gained weight. <laughs> doing that show because every episode you just get like hungry. It's so awesome. Yeah, go watch Toriko. Uh, it's, Lucy has not asked a question yet. I'm so sorry. I know we have just four minutes for those. I want to make sure that everybody who did not get to ask a question gets to ask one. 
Yes. All right, so I have two things. Um, in Diabolic Lovers, who do you ship Yui Kamori with the most? I don't really know all that much about Diabolic Lovers, unfortunately, because Subaru literally took me 30 minutes to record the entire series. <laughs> he, that's how much he talks. 12 episodes, half an hour. Like, and really, and most of the time he does talk, it's just, whatever. So, like, stuff like that. So, like, yeah, I mean, I know so little about that show. I'm so sorry. If you uh, could choose one, I do, I do think that he was the least creepy out of the four, out of the other guys, so I would definitely ship him with her because I think she would be safer. <laughs> so. Can you do his voice? Do what? Can you do, like, your favorite line by him or? No, I guess I could do a line if you want. <laughs> like, actually, no, there you go. That's Subaru, because I don't remember his lines. <laughs> like, there was that one where he's just like, I just, why would you just shut up and let me help you? Type thing. Yeah, there's something along those lines. But yeah, he's an angry boy. Okay, who did not get to ask a question? You, I know, did not. Yes. Um, so, how do you feel when your characters get shipped with another character, such as Victor and Yuri? Well, if it makes sense, then absolutely. Like, I, I feel like the Victor and Yuri ship makes sense. Um, and Yurio and Odebeck probably could be. But, like, when I hear stuff like, like, uh, like, Armin and Aaron, I'm just like, I don't see that happening. I'm sorry. Like, I just don't. Like, I can see maybe Armin and Annie? Yeah. Maybe Armin and Krista? But, like, Ymir would not be interested. <laughs> unless he was dressed as Krista. <laughs> uh, and uh, Annie's in a crystal, so probably not gonna happen. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe Hanji, Armin and Hanji. I can see that maybe a little bit. Though the best ship is Levi and Levi and Windex. <laughs> That's hands down. I mean, Levi and Windex is right there, right there. All right, I think, is that pretty much all we have time for? Are we done? One more. One more question. All right. It's like, you, do, and we're doing the group selfie. Yes. All right. We'll do it. You with the blue hair did not get to ask. Um, if there was a Yuri and Ice Free crossover, do you think you would have gotten the Yuri and Ice Free crossover? Do you think Nidori and Yuri would get along? If there was a free, cro a free crossover? Yuri and Ice. With Yuri and Ice. Yeah. Yuri get along with who? Nidori. Oh, my God. Absolutely. Yeah. I think they get each other. Like, immediately, they'd just be like, Friend, brother, comrade, I get how you feel. <laughs> like, Ren? Victor. We're good. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys so much for your questions and for coming this week, and I hope you had a great time. Please be safe getting home wherever that is, and I hope to see you again in another couple of years. Let's get that selfie. Woo! Yeah, you guys can just, like, skip. Yeah. 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 We're all friends here. Yeah. It's a little hard. Touching. Yeah. 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 Yeah.